So this morning we're looking at when you receive the word of God, when you receive the word of God. And this is a very important thing because the, the Bible uses the word receive multiple times right through the scriptures and many times in relation to receiving the word of God itself. So as you know, uh, people have a uh, choice when they come to hearing what is preached or taught from the Bible. They can choose to know, I'm not to say no, I'm not going to listen to that or, and rebel against it. Or they can choose to say, I'm going to receive that as a word from the Lord himself. Let's have a look at a few scriptures. Proverbs 2, verse, starting from verse 6, going to verse 10. Proverbs 2. Now, the Lord showed me, as I was preparing for this, he showed me that what we put priority on, we will gladly go out of our way to attend to and do. And you see that all the time. What people put priority on in their lives, they will gladly go out of their way to, uh, even to the extent of going, um, you know, hours of traveling and uh, getting up early to do things and so on. They'll put attention onto it and they'll, they'll, they'll do it as well. Uh, looking at Proverbs 2, and we'll start from verse 6. Notice what it says. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So obviously it's coming out of his mouth. It's talking about the word of God. So out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So you need to understand this. And it's the Lord that giveth wisdom. Wisdom is the correct application of knowledge. Okay. So it's not just that you know something, but you're able to use that knowledge to be able to do the right thing. Verse 7, he layeth up sound wisdom for the, what's that? Righteous. Now, if you've been born again, then you're righteous. You're no longer a sinner. You're a servant of righteousness, a servant of God. You're a child of God and you're righteous by what Jesus has done. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. So think about that. The sound wisdom laid up for you and me. And uh, notice what it says. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. Well, a buckler is a little shield. Okay. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. So there is a protective element to all of this. If people are getting God's wisdom and knowledge and understanding in their lives, as it says there, he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. If they're getting that into their lives, Notice what it says there after he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous, colon, which means this is the result, this is what's going to happen. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Verse 8, he keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. So we see there's a, uh, an element in all of this of protection and preservation and strength coming into your lives. But we have to see the source of sound wisdom is from God. Okay, The Bible talks about uh, a wisdom that comes from below and a wisdom that comes from above. We want the wisdom that comes from above, the wisdom that comes from God himself. Because there's all types of words out there, all types of people speaking. We want to have the wisdom that comes from the Lord himself so that our way is preserved verse 9 then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity yea every good path so god wants you to understand what's a good path to be walking in but you have to understand that he wants his wisdom to be put into your life now how does that happen how do you get that wisdom put into your life comes through choice, doesn't it? comes through choice so that when there is the word preached or taught or you look into the word of God and to the Bible, you, the Bible says that we should be students, study to show thyself approved. When you look into the Bible, you see that there are things that apply to your life specifically. Praise the Lord. So he wants you to be 
going along every good path. In verse 10, when wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. Now we could go more and more into there, but I just wanted to emphasize that wisdom has to enter into your heart. Wisdom has to enter into people's hearts. It doesn't uh, enter in unless people make a choice to expose themselves to it and say, yes, I choose to receive that. I choose to receive that. Okay? And uh, so God wants also knowledge to be pleasant to your soul. And that'll give you a prosperous soul. The soul is your mind, will, and emotions. So knowledge to be pleasant to your soul. Knowledge from God to be pleasant to your soul. Have a look across to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 3. And you'll see that right at the very beginning of our Christian walk, in 1 Corinthians 15, right at the very beginning of our Christian walk, we had to receive. We had to receive what the gospel was saying. And uh, so I just want to, you to see that word receive is opposite to the word rebel. Okay, you think about that. I receive that or I rebel against that or push back against that. So 1 Corinthians 15, starting from verse 1, notice what it says. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, that's the good news about Christ and his salvation, which I preached unto you. That's how the word came, wasn't it? Preaching. Which also ye have, what? Received, and wherein ye stand. So there's that, that sound wisdom that's come in. The gospel says you were, you were a sinner, you're in need of, uh, of God, you're in need of a saviour, and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was pointed to as the one who gives that full salvation. He's paid for it by his blood. So, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Okay, so, it's not just a matter of saying, oh yeah, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people say that. But notice, you've got to receive and you've got to stand in it and you've got to keep it in your memory. You've got to have the, the right understanding about it. And then he goes on and we'll read verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So there's the first part of the gospel. We were sinners, dead in trespasses and sins, separated from God. But it says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. We can go forward in that. But I just wanted you to see the word received. Right at the very beginning, you received what was preached. Okay? And you believed it. And now you stand in it. Glory to God. Let's have a look at Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4. Now that you're a Christian, you need to be a person who is open to the Word of God on a constant basis. And we'll see examples of that as we go through. So we're looking at Proverbs 4. And we'll start from verse 18. Proverbs 4. 18 to 22. Proverbs 4, starting from verse 18, says, But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Well, your path should be getting better and better in Christ, not worse and worse, okay? The more you're responding to the word, the more you're listening to it, the more you're receiving what it has to say. It's like a shining light that shineth more and more. Verse 19, the way of the wicked is as darkness. Why? Because they're not in the light. Okay? So remember what I said before. If you 
put priority on something, you're going to go out of your way to attend to it. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto them, those that find them, and health to all their flesh. So verse 20 tells us, attend to my words. That means pay attention. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. So be a person that's ready to hear. Let them not depart from thine eyes. So you're constantly into the word. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Your heart has to be receptive to the word of God. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What type of church does God want? Strong. He wants a strong word church, doesn't he? A word church. So let's have a look at Ephesians 5 and we'll see what God is wanting in Ephesians 5. 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Notice that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Notice that it says that he might sanctify, that means separate it from evil and wrong things, and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That means that the washing of water by the word has to be part of the church life. That means that there has to be the, the preaching of the word coming in, the teaching of the word, and the people of God receptive to that word. It's where the word received comes in, doesn't it? And notice what type of church that Jesus wants to present to himself, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And that happens through the washing of water by the word. So in these days, God is wanting a word washed church. He's wanting a church that is going to be receiving his wisdom and his knowledge and understanding. A church whereby people are receptive to his word. And of course, John 17 says, verse 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So we're set apart from evil and going the wrong way, and we're set apart unto the Lord through the word of God. Okay, so we came in through the word, the, the uh, word that we received, the gospel, and now we are people that are part of continually receiving that word into our life, even as the very food of God. I preached a sermon last week called Growing in the Lord. You might like to get hold of that one and refresh your memory. Let's have a look at Acts 2, verses 38 to 41. Acts 2. Now, the book of Acts has a lot in it in relation to people receiving the word preached. Now, you, you will know that it is my firm belief that the greatest work that the church must do on the earth is to preach the word of God, preach the gospel and the word of God so the people are able to be changed and that they're not only just 
individuals, but whole societies can be changed. And that's something that's very, very important. Acts chapter 2, verses 38 to 41. Let's look at that. 38 to 41. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Remission means taking away of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. That's what verse 41 says. Then they that gladly received his word were baptised, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So there has to come a gladness in the receiving. A gladness in the receiving. Gladly received the word that was preached. And you can read uh, his sermon there, or most of his sermon in Acts chapter 2 there. And when they gladly received it, there was action that happened as a consequence of that. They, were, they obviously received the Lord Jesus Christ and they were then baptised, baptised in his name. That, when you're publicly baptised... In the name of the Lord, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, people see that you're serious about your faith and you're going forward. So they gladly received his word. That word received is very, very important for us to grab hold of. So when you receive the word of God, are you doing it gladly? Gladly? You know, gladness. Think about it. Or as we have met up with in the past, we think people are receiving it, but inwardly, they're not glad about it at all. They're resistant to it, rebellious to it. That's not good because in order for a whole, uh, well, personally for us to change, but also for a nation or a society to change, there has to be that receiving of the word Okay, there's many words out there that I mentioned to you, many, many words, and they're competing words. And many of them are saying things exactly the opposite to what the Christian faith would say. Okay, the word of God. We want to be people that are receiving the word of God. Have a look at James 1, verse 21. Well, verse 22 as well. Verse 21 says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive, so you lay, lay apart the wrong things and the wrong words and the wrong way of thinking. And what do you do? Receive with meekness. Now, what's that word meekness is about? about? Meekness says, Not my will, but your will, Lord. Not my will, but your will. And Jesus said, Blessed are the meek. Because what are they doing? They're bowing their knees to the will of God. Okay, receive with meekness, what? The engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Let's talk about that. Engrafted means it becomes a part of you. Okay, engrafted word becomes a part of you. It goes into your heart, into your inner man, becomes a part of you. It says, which is able to save your soul. Now, James is is um, writing to, to people who have saved from sin, their spirits have been born again, but their souls, their mind, will and emotion has to be changed. And that's what it's talking about, saving of the soul. Okay? Your mind, will and emotion get in line being with meekness, the engrafted word of God. And that's important for us to see that. And then what happens? Verse 22, but be ye doers of the word, and not here is only deceiving your own selves. So when you receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul, able to change your soul so that your mind is renewed, 
and your thinking is renewed and you know there's godly emotion the bible talks a lot about things like happiness and joy and and we read about gladness uh, so all of that comes into line as you receive with meekness the engrafted word that's saving your soul you have a a, a prosperous soul then and uh, that can bring into your life all types of good things that God wants you to have through his salvation. Praise the Lord. And so if you look back at the book of Acts, because there's quite a lot to, in the book of Acts with respect to receiving the word and how we should receive it. So let's look at Acts 6 verse 7. We quoted this the other day because this is what God wants to happen. This is what God wants to happen in a society. Acts 6, verse 7. And it says, And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So what does God want in the, in the society? The word of God increased increased you know now you, you you could watch tv all day and there would barely be any mention of the lord or his word or the bible so that should tell you something it should tell you that if you're immersing yourself in that it's not going to give you that increase of the word that you need we need to be able to receive the word and that means we need to be able to expose ourselves to where the word is. Obviously through the preaching and teaching of the word, through our own personal studying of the word and reading of the word and meditation of the word. Okay. Obviously uh, Bible services such as this one give you an opportunity to hear the word preached and taught. But you have to, when you come out of the service, you have to be responsible for your own Christian walk, okay? I can't be right there next to you. Come on, you do that. Oh, get into the Word. Oh, you confess the Word here. No, no, no. You've got to be open to the Lord and say, Lord, I am a believer in Christ. I believe your Word and I'm putting it into action every day in my life. I've, re I've received the Word and I'm going to continue to receive what it has to say. We, we read before that that'll keep you in the good path. It'll keep you in a place where God wants you to be. Have a look also at Acts 8. We'll look at verses 5 and 6 in Acts 8. When you read right through Acts, you see that there's a lot of good things happen, a lot of expansion and so on. But you also see how do people approach the Word of God. We've read a few things now. Gladly received it. The Word of, word of God increased. So it's been planted in good ground and it's producing fruit, it's increasing. And Acts 8, verses 5 and 6, let's read that one. Then Philip went down, Philip is an evangelist. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and what did he do? Preached. Preached Christ unto them. Obviously that's the gospel, isn't it? And what Christ has done. Glory to God. And notice what it says in verse 6. And the people with one accord gave heed, it means they were listening, gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So we see that they gave heed unto the things which Philip spake. And he had a miraculous ministry. Of course, uh, as the word of God is preached, the Bible tells us, that the Lord confirms the word with signs following. Glory to God. Now, notice that he preached, they gave heed, things were happening, and then there was another development. If you go forward to verses 14 to 17 of that chapter, 14 to 17, it says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had what? received the word of God. That's a real key. They received it. They didn't rebel against it. 
They didn't say, well, we refuse this preaching about Christ. They, re they had received it. They sent unto them Peter and John. Peter and John were apostles with a particular ministry. Verse 15, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. So this is another experience, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. But we won't talk about that today. Verse 16, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. So you can see that there's this, there's this salvation experience. People get saved. And God wants you to go on to be filled with the Spirit as well. Okay? So if you don't know much about that, we've got some sermons on the website related to being filled with the Spirit of God. But to understand that the first thing is that people respond to the gospel and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. They get born again, okay? And then we see that the apostles uh, had heard that Samaria had received the word of God. They'd received the word of God and with gladness and took heed. And then other things could be done for that, that, that people. They could be then taken into greater blessings. And that's what that was all talking about. And verse 17 says, Then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. And uh, as much we could say about that, but that is all about power to witness, powerful witness for Christ. It's not, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is not about salvation. You can be saved and never be filled with the Spirit of God. But God's will is for you to go on and be filled with the Spirit of God. Okay, so you see the difference. So let's continue on. Acts 17. Acts 17, verses 10 to 13. Let's look at that. Let me just go through a few more scriptures. Because I really think this is an important thing we have to get into our hearts so that when we are living our lives... Uh, you don't need the minister to be, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll never do it, because the Lord told me years ago not to try to force people through walls. Okay. I was trying to get people to do the right thing, but the Lord said, no, don't do that. Don't do that. They've got a free choice. They can choose to receive or they can choose to reject. Okay? And that's, that's the approach that the Lord wants uh, his ministers to take. Acts 17, 10 to 13. Starting from verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they what received the word with all readiness of mind. So you've got to be ready to receive, readiness of mind. So, for example, before you come to a, a service, you say, I'm, I'm ready to receive from you, Lord. I know you've got something for me so that I can be better and do things for you in a greater way. I'm ready to receive. So they received the word with all readiness of mind and, <coughs> this, is a, this is a great encouragement to us, and search the Scriptures Daily, whether those things were so. Okay, search the scriptures daily. We should be searching the scriptures daily as well. Notice that these people were called noble, more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Glory to God. Glory to God. Let's continue on. Verse 12. Therefore, many of them believed also of honourable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had no knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. Yes, there is opposition to the word of God, and I'm sure you're all aware of that opposition to the word of God but you know we should not allow that to stop us from receiving we should not allow that 
to stop us from being people with readiness of mind and searching the scriptures daily. Glory to God. I just want to finish with 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 11 to 13. And I pray that today you have seen that receiving the word of God requires a choice. A choice to be glad, to be ready, to say, I, I acknowledge where true wisdom and understanding comes from. Praise the Lord. So, First Thessalonians, looking at chapter 2, and we'll start from verse 11 and go to verse 13. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. So let's just stop there for a minute. What are the ministers of God doing here? They're exhorting, comforting and charging. That is, uh, making it clear to people, okay, as a father doth his children. So it's in a nurturing way, isn't it? It's not like trying to, you know, get people to to do things against their free will, but it's in a, a nurturing way that ye would walk worthy of God. We saw before in Ephesians 5 that God wants a word-washed church holy. Holy, okay? Holy means you're walking worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. If you've been born again, you've been called unto his kingdom and glory. And notice what it says in verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, so it came out of the preachers, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Can you see what this is saying? It's saying that when ye receive the word of God, you're receiving it as in truth the word. Okay, and understanding, understanding that there it is effectually working in you that believe you're you're approaching it in a believing way, and it is working in you. It is working in you. If you're in a church that concentrates uh, much much less on the Word of God, then you can see that with that de-emphasis of the word of God, it's not going to do as much good to the people. Okay? So you see, we're not, we don't emphasise uh, uh, other things over and above the word here. And that'll always be the case. It'll always be the word of God is the primary thing that people have to be fed with and they have an opportunity to receive, to receive, praise the Lord. So I pray that you're going to be people that are growing in the Lord, <laughs> receiving the word of God constantly, and it's going to do good things in your heart, and good things in your life. It's going to cause you to be a person of strength, a person that's going to be growing in the Lord constantly. Glory to God. Let's close in prayer.